So I'm going to be discussing the role of uh, prostate cancer biomarkers with respect to early detection through diagnosis and then outcome. And then you've heard a lot about various levels of biomarkers going through this talk. And so just to give you some idea of how that plays out, I'm a clinical advisor to Exosome, and I also work on a scientific advisory board for Synvenio. So today's, uh, we'll go through some of the introduction to biomarkers. So f although folks are familiar with what biomarkers are, I thought it'd be good to just share some of what my belief, as well as others, with regards to biomarkers, the role that they play in prediction of prostate cancer. So we heard a lot about from Pete and others with regards to the management side with metastatic disease, which is very different than moving that needle back to early diagnosis and strategies surrounding that. And then post-diagnosis, what's next in that field? And that's really at the point that Lori will touch upon in greater detail, which is the role of active surveillance and other strategies. And then post-treatment and advanced disease, which Howard Sewell touched on. I'll talk a little bit about that from biomarkers, but you'll see there's still quite a bit that needs to be done within regards to that area. So clinically, roles for biomarkers touch upon a variety of different points in the spectrum of disease of prostate cancer. So looking at a patient's risk of developing cancer in the future is one of the, obviously, the ideas behind efforts for screening. And screening, obviously, is designed around earlier detection to decrease mortality. And that I'll mention with respect to PSA is actually how PSA was first established. Diagnostically, as pathologists, it's all who has cancer, origin type, grade, stage, genomic profile of cancer. Those are all important attributes, certainly. Prognosis is something that I think a lot of people sort of misconcept as to what it really means. It's risk of recurrence of disease or death, and that can impact on decision making. And that's really where the active surveillance field has taken quite a change, because it's really looking at that from a prognostic perspective. Monitoring and, and predictive are very good areas with regards to treatment manifestations, and this is where the liquid biopsy piece becomes most critical with regards to post-diagnosis and then managing those patients during monitoring. Very difficult to do subsequent biopsies on patients post-diagnosis. So this is where that whole idea of what Johan spoke of with regards to exosomes and, and other areas, and I think it's an important piece to understand. And then the pharmacogenomic act, uh, piece, which is really looking at abilities to understand and define really what the therapeutic dose is and then levels of response as well as adverse events. So what has been, I think, most important with regards to understanding medicine has always been a personalized approach, so I'm part of the precise group, but reading disease phenotype has been very limiting and, and tricky to do, and so that's really the role of biomarkers or to help in terms of defining that. And uh, now six years ago, uh, Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg had produced what was known as these hallmarks of cancer. And it's interesting from my perspective that the biomarkers that are currently used today really rely on those and then specific areas that we're seeing within this little diagram, which is to look at the idea behind proliferative signaling. So that's a, a part of some of the assays I'll be speaking about, as well as invasion and metastasis. And then, more importantly, what Pete spoke of, which is this tumor-promoting inflammatory response. So those are the key areas that a lot of the genomic strategies that are looking to try to define that potential for risk of recurrence and disease outcome are really focusing on. So it's, it's interesting to see with all the efforts going on and all of our genomic profiling, we still have some main areas that have been established for quite some time. Now, the ideal biomarker is something that is safe and easy means of measurement, preferably non-invasive. So that's really where a lot of the blood-based assessment approaches really drive the field. Should have a high sensitivity and specificity, PPV and MPV, and that's really based on the indications and what you're actually saying the biomarker is designed to really accomplish. And that's a critical piece because that is an understanding of the assay and how it can be effectively used clinically. Importantly is to improve decision-making in conjunction with clinical pathologic parameters. So that's, that's an element that drives sort of the adoption of the biomarker in terms of clinical practice and that decision-making piece. And what would be great is to have it compete or support current standards, because right now we use clinical elements to be able to define a patient phenotype, clinical meaning even the Gleason. But how can you actually add a biomarker to that strategy? Because you really have to compare everything to the standard of care, and that's the only way really with the biomarker can become effective. 
Now, there are uh, several biomarker success stories, and we've heard about some of those with and without the context of prostate cancer, so HER2, ER, PR in breast, BRAF and melanoma, EGFR, and Johan touched upon those with regards to even predictive components now with colorectal cancer, EGFR, KRAS, and NRAS, again, stratifying with regards to treatment response as well as outcome. Oncotype DX in breast is very well established. Colon and now in prostate is coming along. And PSA in prostate cancer, even though it is maligned quite a bit, it is still clinically used quite a bit. And so we sit in academic worlds where we can you know, pontificate about various biomarkers. But out there in the field, PSA is still highly used with regards to determination of early diagnosis, post-response to treatment. And you heard Michael Zaleski speak about that post-radiation treatment. So there's a number of areas that, we'll have, that we still need improvement with prostate cancer. And I'll share with you some of the newer assays that are actually coming online. So with the idea behind PSA itself, and PSA is an interesting prostate cancer chronology, you know, it's, as a, a marker that we clinically use today, identified back in the 80s, and was FDA approved as a screening tool to go along with the DRE. So if you watch how that actually played out, it actually increased the percentage of men that were actually diagnosed with cancer, and the majority of those men actually had indolent disease. So PSA itself fell out of favor from a screening tool and then became used as a supportive measure to understand that whole early indication for when a biopsy should be performed. And as what has, I think, been clearly demonstrated with the United States, the Preventative Services Task Force, and the challenges that they have, that they have I think, uh, entered on because of the change in fields of how to actually effectively use PSA, Back in 2002, there was evidence was insufficient to re, uh, recommend PSA as a screen for men younger than 75. And then in 2009, the both uh, randomized trials in Europe and USA had discordant results with respect to its association and positive effect of a PSA as a screening tool with respect to outcome. So that became a challenge with regards to that. And there's been a recent re-review of the data from in 2017 in the Annals of Internal Medicine about how to actually re-look re at those trials themselves. During that time, in 2012, the Preventative Task Force recommended against PSA screening at any age. So you see this whole uh, change in terms of the course of this is the guidance with which we end up using PSA. And now most recently, and now it's in process, there's a recommendation for PSA screening in the 55 to 69 year old age group and promoting more of a smart screening effort. So from screen everyone, screen no one, to screen a subgroup of patients but do it better is really the message that we're actually receiving. And I think we see that as you run clinical trials today with various biomarkers, the impact of these guidelines has on current practice and the cohorts that you actually end up seeing within those trials are quite different than the cohorts of years ago. So what are the, the limitations, obviously, of PSA? It's not the, the best marker. We know it has issues with specificity and sensitivity, and we've heard about some of those. It is obviously can be super fit and elevated in a variety of benign states, so inflammation, infection, trauma, BPH, all of those can falsely elevate the PSA, and so it'll give you that false positive rate, which is really the challenge behind using PSA very effectively. So there needs to be better ways to do that, and uh, back in 2003, Ian Thompson had published on the PCPT risk trial looking at the lower levels of PSA and the association with positive disease on a biopsy, and so that was a biopsy-driven trial. So you can see even low levels of PSA actually have uh, evidence of cancer at biopsy in a significant percentage of men. So it's a challenge. So what do you do with PSA? And I think there's been you know, now still a push to look at a variety of derivatives of PSA and how to actually effectively use those. So PSA is still an active biomarker, and I'll share with you some of the assays that are currently using it. And then how can we actually expand upon that approach? So the first area to touch upon is early detection and initial diagnosis. So this is really to get at how can we improve over PSA? And this is where that whole idea behind liquid biopsies comes in, because liquid biopsies can be, and they're mostly used currently with respect to cell-free DNA and CTCs. CT and the liquid biopsies are also associated, as Johan described, within the context of exosomes. So these are sort of pieces of the cell that are actually floating around in the blood. So those are physical elements, but also proteins and peptides can be part of that liquid biopsy paradigm. So when you think of liquid biopsies, you think of it as a broad way to be able to use systemic changes from fluids and be able to understand processes that are occurring within the patient. 
So there's a number of ways in which that can be done, and I think that I put the clinical features first because even today, all of the assays that are developed has to have to evaluate their performance characteristics based on clinical characteristics of the patient. So that's age, race, family history, DRE, and then looking at things that are standardly done, like total PSA and percent-free PSA are important variables clinically to be able to define whether there is cancer or not. So that's, that's sort of the level of this. This is an early detection. And if you recall, that whole idea behind PSA as a tool in that setting was not very good. So you were finding a lot of indolent cancers, and there's a tremendous amount of overdiagnosis and then overtreatment of disease. So the push in the field has been to look at more, how do we identify clinically significant disease more effectively? And so that's the, the, when you look at early detection of prostate cancer, that's where you're focusing the efforts on. So the first two that I, I list here are in the blood aspect of uh, identification using this liquid biopsy approach. And the first is the prostate health index assay, which is an FDA-approved assay. It's a blood test, and it's for detection of total PSA, and as well as percent-free PSA, and then uh, what is called 2-pro PSA, which is part of the percent-free PSA compartment. And the idea behind percent free PSA is that the more free PSA you have, meaning unbound PSA by albumin, the more that it's related to benign processes, so not associated with cancer. And that's how it's used. Although if you go out outside of the academic world and you go into community practice, most doctors do not use percent free PSA. So if you talk to patients, they've never had it. They've just gotten a total PSA. So the PHI was developed as a way to be able to do that assay relatively easy on blood, and it's looked at as a formula for identifying that percent pro, mostly pro PSA, because that's a defining element within the percent free compartment of PSA that's present within the blood. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't use it because it hasn't really performed well, and it's again coming back to what is really established as, well, we know PSA is not that great, and percent free PSA, do we, that probably is all we really need, so do we need to use a PHI test at all? So well, I'm leaving that out there as sort of like a decision point just to reflect on the, the PHI as not to say that it's not a good assay, but that's really the reasoning because it is a PSA-based test. A relatively new test is the 4K, and that's also a blood test. It's a detection of similar attributes that are in the PHI. So it is a total PSA, so that's general but you would check to see what your PSA level is in your blood. It's per percent free PSA, it's intact PSA, which is part of that percent free compartment, and it's hemocalocrine 2, which is a serine protease, so that's looking at ways to clip the pro to get the mature form of PSA. So if that sounds confusing, it is, because there's lots of elements of the PSA that we're really trying to redefine and refine its use clinically to be able to understand how this can actually be used effectively in clinical practice. The 4K test is der derives a score, which is based on an algorithm. So that algorithm piece then employs clinical variables in combination with PSA variables that I show you to actually then reflect on how that can actually be used clinically. So those are the two blood-based tests for early detection. And only one of them is FDA approved, and the other is an in vitro diagnostic test run through a CLIA lab, so a laboratory-derived test. The others that are listed there are all urine-based. And so urine-based tests for early detection are very attractive because they're easy ways to be able to access fluid from a patient in a non-invasive way, if you look at drawing blood as being semi-invasive. And they're rel relatively straightforward. The challenge has been with the the several of the tests that are listed is that they all require that post-DRE sample access piece. So the first came out quite a while ago. It is the other, it's an FDA approved test, is for PCA3, and it's a post-DRE urine test. The FDA piece of that was actually derived from men who had an initial negative biopsy, and we're using PSA to help refine whether in fact they had prostate cancer. So that's the FDA indication behind that. And that's detecting levels of PCA3, which are normalized to KLK3, which is PSA that are present within epithelial cells that are present sloughed within the urine itself. So it's a fairly straightforward assay. It looks at the PCA3 levels, and you're doing that based on RNA from the PCA3. But again, it's a post DRE sample, so it's fairly complicated, and I'll come back to that in a second. The second is the Michigan Prostate Score, which is known as MIPS. 
and that's run out of the Michigan laboratory. Again, it's a posterior urine test, so you have to massage the prostate. And this is not just a general massage, but it's actually an aggressive massage of the prostate to be able to collect the material to increase the number of cells, because that's really what you're trying to do in terms of your RNA detection. In the MIPS, MIPS test, you're looking at, again, PCA3. It looks at tempers 2 erg which Pete touched upon. This is a fusion transcript present in about 50 to 60% of prostate cancers. And it also looks at serum total PSA. It's an algorithm and a score way to be able to measure the, with respect to indication for the MIPS. And both PCA3 as well as MIPS are looking at both detection of prostate cancer and now both of them are sort of leaning more towards not just detection of all prostate cancer, but detection of more clinically significant disease. So that's any pattern four that's present within the subsequent biopsy. The SELECT MDX test is another urine-based test, relatively new. It is a post-DRE again. Its urine signature is three genes, and you'll see them there. It's a DLX1, HOXC6, normalized with the KLK3, so that's the, the uh, PSA. Also an algorithm which includes clinical variables. And I think the important point with this is that when you employ clinical variables in these assays, you have to really understand what the weight of that clinical variable is with respect to the score and the accuracy of the assay. And the last one is what Johan mentioned, which is the EPI, which is a non-DRE test. So now you have an assay that not, does not require a DRE to be able to obtain them a sam the sample, which makes a lot of sense if you're trying to employ this clinically in practice and be able to use it to not require a DRE, a pre-DRE, to be able to obtain the sample makes di a difference in terms of how that is adopted clinically and, and use, especially within the flow within clinical practice. And in the epi test, you're detecting expression levels of three genes, so that's PCA3, ERG, and normalized to SPDEF. So this is looking at total ERG, which includes the tempers 2 ERG translocation, plus all ERG that's present within the sample itself. And there's quite a bit of biology surrounding why total ERG is actually as important as the, the fusion transcript as well. This is an algorithm which is independent of clinical variables. So you're not relying on features like a prior negative biopsy or PSA in terms of driving the performance characteristics of the assay. So that's an important piece of how you actually can employ this clinically as well. So liquid biopsies, and I'll touch upon this only because you saw that whole list there of blood and urine are really designed with that liquid biopsy approach. And what does that mean? Well, why, why are they, there challenges surrounding using this? So there's a lot of heterogeneity that makes it difficult to isolate pure analyzable populations. So this is what the issue surrounding liquid biopsy that it can try to mitigate because you're actually able to assess that heterogeneity but in a very uh, broad fashion. It's an effective transition for CTCs, so liquid biopsies encompass the, both the CTC piece as well. And it's moving the CTCs from enumeration or counting of CTCs, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the advanced disease setting to characterization and analysis. So that's an important element that the liquid biopsy field has had to evolve to. So it's no longer just enough to say how many CTCs you have, but what type of CTC do you have? And that CTC is circulating tumor cell. And with all liquid biopsy challenges, they must be sensitive and specific. They must be easy to use, robust, and proven clinical efficacy to be uh, really included within the guidelines. So that becomes a relatively important aspect of this. So there's a number of applications in clinical research for understanding that whole role behind the liquid biopsy piece and how it can be used effectively. So therapeutic decision making, tumor stage, evolution at different time points, review of tumor occurrence. So this is where the liquid biopsy piece becomes most relevant. And those samples that are able to identify both RNA, DNA, as well as protein, and I think Johan touched upon this, is a very important aspect of that entire process of being able to understand. So no longer is one single variable is sufficient. And that's what's happening in the CTC side as well. It's not just the number of CTCs, as I mentioned, but it's the characteristics of those CTCs, as well as the genomics of those CTCs that make them so important. So to touch, go back to some of those assays that I, I pointed out with respect to early detection, because I think it's important to understand them. The FDA-approved test, the prostate health index, used to support two clinical scenarios. One is the diagnosis of prostate cancer. So this is to get at the idea of do we need to have repeat biopsying and repeat testing if you would like to avoid a biopsy. 
They do promote that it may provide indications regarding tumor aggressiveness as well as suggesting surgery or radiation. So all of them are trying to move in the level of prediction, but there's really no clinical data to actually support that. So right now it sort of stands in that identification of cancer, and yes, it may help with defining aggressive disease, Gleason score seven, but it may not. This is what the blood test looks like for 4K score. So this is what the report would look like if you actually got the 4K score from a patient or a urologist's perspective. And what it does is allows you to do is to define a score that's associated with different buckets of risk. So you have low risk, you'll have intermediate risk, and you'll have high risk based on the score that you obtain. And this is a score that's derived from those four PSA types that I mentioned, plus clinical variables. What doesn't clearly come out in the report itself is that, and what drives it if you talk to urologists that may have put down that the patient had a prior negative biopsy, that that prior negative biopsy feature when it gets put into the algorithm will actually change the entire score with respect to the outcome of what the assay actually means. So this is where clinical variables become very important with respect to the algorithm, which then is used in the combination with the, the elements that are using to derive the, the final score itself. So it changes some of the flavor and the importance of the assay itself. So prior negative biopsy is where the indication was originally used, and more recently now it's in the initial biopsy setting, and it's identifying to the Gleason 7 prostate cancer. It may provide an indication regarding tumor aggressiveness, suggesting surgery or radiation. So these are some of the potential indications. But again, it's not clinically validated yet with respect to that. So it's really limited to the Gleason score seven space at both the initial biopsy as well as a prior negative. The second FDA approved test in addition to PHI is the posterior urine test, which is PCA3. So this is based on the FDA approval, which only men that had a prior negative biopsy would be appropriate for the PCA3 based on the accuracy of the assay itself. And you can see how the score is, des is derived. And so the, when the FDA trial was done, they had a validated cut point with respect to the actual PCA3 assay. Clinically, that has changed with respect to what the cut point is. So people do a variety of swings on either side of a, of a PCA3 score of 25, which was the validated score to be able to get at some of the more really comfort level with respect to using it clinically. So this again looks at the diagnosis of prostate cancer with repeat testing and goes through that similar scenario with regards to how it can be used clinically, but it's not validated. The last one on the list was that EPI test, so that's the exosome diagnostics test. This is the EPI score. And so it's a very simple way to be able to receive the information with respect to the patient score. It is independent of clinical variables, so that, you, that whole prior negative space is not part of it. And remember, the EPI test is without a DRE, and it's at the time of initial biopsy. And so there you're getting a score, and it's binary with respect to low or high risk for clinically significant disease, which is Gleason score seven. So we know from the publication that it was valuable both in the initial setting as well as in a small set of patients for derived from the published trial that it also performed equally well in the prior negative group as well. Again, similarly, with regards to that indication with aggressive disease, uh, mostly associated with a surgery and outcomes and radiation treatment, not clinically validated as of yet with regards to that. And I'll skip some of the things that Johan had showed about the exosomes because I think that he uh, handled it well with regards to how they actually are formed. What is unique within that whole idea behind collection, ex collection of exosomes is that it's a first catch urine sample, can be run easily within the clinic, so there's no need for that DRE to be able to interrupt the flow of the patient, and this is just a urine can a sample that's collected within a specific urine collection device. So the fact that you can actually collect those exosomes and use them that and be very prostate cancer specific was a unique way to start employing that clinically. And there's published efforts that I think was also fascinating is that if you continue to collect large volumes of urine from these patients, you can look at the entire GU tree, not just the prostate, but you can look at all elements of the segmented nephron. So it's, it's quite a unique tool. And as Joanne went through, both looking at this from a variety of perspectives are important from RNA as well as DNA and proteins make it a very valuable tool. Now, I think it's, it's worthwhile to talk a little bit about that in terms of the genes that were used and that multivariate algorithm, because that really gets at some of the essence of these assays, which is you're looking for significantly 
uh, elevated Gleason scores in a biopsy. So that's a Gleason 7 uh, pattern that you're actually trying to identify. And it's with a specific population of men. So this is this equivocal group of patients that are presenting with that 2 to 10 range where it's unclear what's, what's going on with them and do you move forward with the biopsy. And this is where this assay can actually help using those levels of ERG and PCA3 with, with, with uh, regards and in conjunction with SPDEF as a normalizer. You can actually see how that would actually play out. And I think Johan touched upon with, and as well with all these assays, it's important to understand the numbers of patients that were actually went into the assay design and the development, as well as how that is actually performed with regards to specific characteristics. And so there's been a number of presentations with this, and Jim McKiernan from, as Chief of Chair of Urology from uh, Columbia was the lead author on the JAMA Oncology paper, which I think is an important aspect of this. And I think Johan showed this from the paper as well. So with all of these assays, you're really trying to design ways in terms of avoiding a biopsy. As I mentioned, there's this overdiagnosis of indolent disease. And so that impacts in all the morbidity associated with a biopsy. And most people think that maybe a biopsy can be managed quite effectively. But there's a number of parameters of that that are rather challenging. And I think that's really where this gets positioned well, to try to avoid that number, but not increasing the risk to the patient of missing significant disease. And so the percentages of disease that you miss focus quite a bit on that dominant four pattern because that's that ICIP-3 category which as you saw on what John was showing, the risk with respect to outcome can actually change. So you try to reduce that level of missing dominant four patterns quite significantly and the assay performed quite well. And you can see when in the published uh, waterfall plots, by looking at on the x-axis, you'll see the patients with regards to the biopsy characteristics and then on the y-axis, the score itself. And with cut points, you can actually define and use it clinically to be able to reflect on the number of patients that are not likely to have Gleason 7 prostate cancer. And this was an assay that is taking the benign as well as your Gleason pattern 6 and incorporating those as a negative. And then anything with a Gleason pattern 7, as you see there is in the yellow and the red lines, are looking at it from a, and being able to define that and discriminate this. This is really the essence behind the epi test itself. And subsequent work has been able to look at this, and I think this is where you start moving the needle forward with some of these assays. If you can look at elevations of the, the, of the EPI score, so you'll see in comparisons with regards to uh, the, these are patients from the trial that went on to a radical prostatectomy, so now you have the objective evidence within the radical prostatectomy to be able to define what was happening with the EPI score at the time of the initial biopsy. And you can see the elevations in the EPI score are associated really with higher levels levels and higher grade disease within the prostatectomy, where standard parameters like PSA are not really reflective of what's happening within the prostatectomy. So you're using the epi score and the elevation of the epi score as a surrogate for a disease that's present within the prostatectomy. Still early stage, but it's getting at some of the ideas behind how these assays can be deployed and used potentially in an, even in an active surveillance setting, because at that point you're only having the biopsy to be able to make a decision on therapeutics. So now we're moving forward from early detection to post-diagnosis. So what do you do once you have a diagnosis of prostate cancer? So this is a different, different world with regards to what is currently available and how to actually use it. In the post-diagnosis initiation of treatment setting, you can do this both with biopsy tissues as well as with prostatectomy tissues because they have different, really, in, you know, in the paradigm of treatment, they're at different clinical points. Clinical features become very critical with the same as what I showed you in that early diagnosis setting, except you don't have really any objective evidence of what the disease is like, meaning you don't have the tissue biopsy itself. So there's a number of nomograms that can be used to help refine, and this is getting at some of the disease potential that's associated in the diagnostic biopsy. I think you heard about the CAPRA score system that was developed at UCSF that helps to use clinical features to define what that risk is like. So you can use that, and you can use that both at the prostatectomy stage, which is the CAPRA S score, which uses the features in the prostatectomy to define outcome, or you use clinical features that are available just within the biopsy itself. So in this setting, with the actual tissue biopsy, that's why this is different, because now we're looking at not liquid biopsy material, but actual physical tissue that's, of being, that's available for evaluation. And one area that's come up is since there's a high percentage of men that actually are di that have benign or negative biopsies at the time of their initial biopsy, like a huge percentage, 70%. 
So with that large number of men, well, how, what do you do with them? And so there are assays that have been developed through Hopkins and then now with a, a company called uh, MDX Health that has been able to look at that negative biopsy and look at detect methylation patterns in specific genes as a tool to be able to define the likelihood that there is cancer somewhere present within the gland. So that's a confirmed MDX approach to be able to look at those uh, those specific genes, and then say, yes, you probably should have another biopsy. Now, that's, the, the, and Laurie will touch upon this as well, because there's obviously, you heard about the radiology side, that there's a number of clinical parameters that are used in that decision, so this is one piece of information. Now, after you've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, so what do you, what do, you do? And so there's this whole treatment and outcome risk component that's required, and that's done both in the biopsy as well as biopsy and prostatectomy. So all of the assays that are available, except for the GPS, which is the genomic health one, is looking at this from both levels because you're trying to capture as many patients as possible with regards to that diagnostic paradigm of where you are in that treatment panel. So the GPS, Oncotype DX for prostate, which is different than Oncotype DX for breast, is a 17 gene panel with housekeeping genes, and this one incorporates the NCCN guidelines. So that, that uses clinical data to define a level of risk, and then a gene signature to overlay with that to say, okay, this is still a low risk patient or very low risk patient. And I'll touch upon that when I show you what the report looks like. In the biopsy and or prostatectomy specimen, there's a number of assays that are currently available, all with different degrees of accuracy with regards to how you would actually deploy it. So the decipher frost prostate is used both in the biopsy as well as in the prostatectomy specimen. It's a 22 gene panel, so this is an RNA-based analysis off of fixed tissue. So all of these assays here in the tissue side are using formalin fixed tissues, which makes them very accessible clinically and being able to use it commercially to develop assays. So it's a, a really a very nice way to do it outside of requiring fresh frozen tissue. This is the Decipher Prostate PX is, uh, again, looking at this with regards to an independent of clinical of features to be able to predict outcome. The Prolara score, built by Myriad Genetics, is using the proliferative indices. So coming back to when I first started with what Doug Hanahan and those guys had spoken about is that proliferative aspect of this is an important element of how to predict. And then I'll touch upon the precise post-op assay, which is being developed here at Mount Sinai. So the genomic prostate score, Oncotype DX, is one that uses features, and this is what the report would look like that the urologist and patient would get. Based on the, in the top panel is the NCCN score of how that patient's risk profile is actually designed. And there's characteristics within the NCCN guidelines that I won't go into, but that looks at ways to define prostate cancer risk at diagnosis and very low, low or intermediate risk by NCCN. And how does the gene expression profile reflect that? And from that, you'll be able to get information of the likelihood of having either metastasis or death from prostate cancer at the time of that diagnosis. So this is a tool that's guided men for making a decision with regards to active surveillance, because if you're confirmed to be a very low risk at a gene signature, as well as with the guidelines, then you are advised on some level, and of course that's a discussion, of whether active surveillance is the best option for you. With the decipher test, so this is a post-prostatectomy, both biopsy, again, you're using prostatectomy tissues or biopsy tissues, and you're predicting high-grade disease if it's, the, if it's a biopsy, because you're predicting high-grade disease in the prostatectomy, or metastasis or prostate cancer-specific death. So different ways of using the assay itself to be able to define that. And this is what the report looks like. So you'll actually get these three buckets and it looks like a chromosome when they <laughs> present the data. And it gives you that whole idea behind this low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk with regards to the likelihood of having disease progression. So genomic signatures that looking at metastasis and death and outcome at the time of diagnosis, both at biopsy or prostatectomy, help in the management of patients with regards to what to do, whether it's active surveillance at the biopsy setting or post-prostatectomy, should you be watched more closely, should you be enrolled in a trial, what are some of the elements that you should be able to look at with regards to what your true risk profile is. The last one on that list that I showed you from the tissue-based side is the precise post-op, the precise methodologies. And so this was something that Carlos and I got involved with quite some time ago with regards to building some of the parameters around systems pathology, precise pathology. So using morphometry and image analysis combined with clinical data 
and ways to do multiplex protein profiling within tissue sections and bring all that together in an algorithmic fashion to be able to predict outcomes of risk. So as you can see, there's a large, fairly large number of papers that we published over the years in looking at how this would actually be derived. And Ken touched upon this. Some of this was driven by the fact that in prostate cancer, if you're a man and you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, you really will not get any ancillary testing. We will do at Sinai a precise immuno test, look at specific markers. We'll be using the, uh, what I'll show you. Uh, but currently out there in the world, you get a diagnosis of cancer and then you have to make a decision. And there's nothing else done with that. So we had published and knew that certain parameters when you start looking at it, and it's in the literature, but it's not really well, I think, uh, I think called out with respect to its importance, is the, the degree of level of, of androgen receptor variability that's seen. And if you start looking at that, you can actually sort of uh, discriminate patients that are, have lower high risk for outcome based just on one single marker alone. So when we developed this, we looked at ways to look integrate a lot of components of this whole process of identifying specific features within tissue and then using this approach to be able to coordinate it all together. And I think one of the ways in which we developed this is to look at assays that you would take fixed tissue sections and then start identifying specific parameters that are present within the tissue. And I realize the, the lighting is not great and so the fluorescent images may not show up. But this was a way to discriminate specific markers and quantify them within fixed tissue sections and take those features and then integrate them to be able to come out with a score that's actually predictive for outcome. And Ken showed and many others of how to actually, why, why go about this effort? And, and this was some of the assessment piece with regards to Gleason grading itself. Gleason still is a subjective assessment. So even though Ken and I may disagree, we agree on the swings of that, that, that you're one versus you're five, that whole area in the middle is, is somewhat subjective. And I think even patients we heard about, but I, you know, I'm at the middle of that entire scale, but it really is a gradient. And it's not just, you know, we sort of bucket them because that's what uh, Gleason did, but it's really a way to be able to look at that in a much more continuum and a distribution as opposed to doing it just by doing buckets. And the morphology itself that that's changed over time and how, how we bucket those has played out with respect to how we can use morphometry to refine it. So this way of doing automated prostate Gleason grading is one of the drivers behind what we've been working on for quite some time. And not to, I won't go into a lot of detail because this is using advanced image analysis tools and artificial intelligence to extract the features that are present within the tissue itself. So what that allows you to do is take that profile that I showed you of that categorization of Gleason, but then use morphometry from the immunofluorescent image to be able to further categorize and quantify Gleason into a whole other level that currently does not exist. And I'll just go through some images of what that looks like since these are all fluorescent-based approaches. So first you have to understand the construct of what the tissue is like. So you use DAPI to look at the nuclei. You can segment the DAPI with image analysis. Then you use Voronoi diagrams, so these are ways in which you could assess ring structures within the tissue, so that looks at really the overall architecture of a single gland and then its relationship to each other, as well as to the stroma. And there's ways in which you could use that piece to create your morphometry and then integrate it with what we know and understand to be the biology surrounding specific markers that are within the tissue itself. And there's a lot uh, understood about androgen receptor levels within tissue and the loss of androgen receptor in the stroma as the invasive piece of the cancer actually is driving the disease is quite important. So loss of androgen receptor in the stroma actually is associated with a variety of biological changes within the cancer that I won't go into. So you need ways to exploit that. So we did by using immunofluorescence of androgen receptor through image analysis, you can actually define what that looks like. So cytokeratin stains the epithelial cells. We have the DAPI segmentation piece. That's what androgen receptor looks like fluorescently. You can't really see too much of it in that image. Then you can look at that relative rise feature of androgen receptor. So that's the differential, the dynamic between what's present within the stroma versus what's present within the epithelial cells. And then coming back to the cytokeratin piece, looking at DAPI segmentation, another example of AR, and then that AR relative rise feature. So you can construct features that use both morphometry and biology to reflect outcomes. And for us, we do the concordance index, which is the time to event analysis. 
So there's ways in which you could further expand that entire approach to morphometry and image analysis, and just in the limit of time, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but taking these composite views of immunofluorescence, overlaying it with that ring function that I showed you before of what are good glands versus bad glands, and then overlaying that with androgen receptor as well as, as, well as KS67 allows you to rephenotype prostate cancer, to rephenotype it in a way that does not exist currently. And we finished a validation study just recently, which is out for review and for publication, which looks at specific features that are driving the outcome. And in this case, we're looking at neoadjuvant rise of PSA, post-treatment. So looking at clinically significant disease in the post-prostatectomy setting. And I think what's important is that this actually incorporates clinical features such as the pathologic stage and in conjunction with these combined features, that makes it a very important variable with respect to outcomes. So these are the types of new assays that are coming forward to be able to do that. Now in the last few minutes, I'll just talk briefly about advanced metastatic disease since we're going through that entire continuum. This is really based specifically just on fluid biopsies. So this is the approaches to be able to understand manifestations of disease when they've recurred. And so serum biomarkers are still used, so that PSA, continues to flow through this entire talk because it's still used clinically with regards to monitoring response, PSA doubling times, including 50% change in PSA in clinical trials as a way to measure response. So it's still important. EpiSpot is a way to look at secreted proteins that are sloughed off of tumor cells. So this gets into the proteomic side of using and addressing advanced disease. And then within the circulating tumor cell space and the exosomes, there's quite a bit of activity. And you've heard a little bit about what was done initially with the cell search assays for quantifying CTCs. So that's the only FDA-approved test currently available, not clinically used, but it allows you to give out the number of CTCs that are present. Whereas other ways to evaluate the CTCs is becoming more in vogue. And so using ways like the EPIC test, which looks at androgen receptor variant 7, so we went through the splice variant before, as well as other ways to look at other components of the, the CTCs. So PDL1 immunofluorescent immunohistochemistry assays on CTCs is sort of the next generation of the types of tests that will be available to monitor patients with respect to response. And then exosomes are the last one, and that's uh, assays that are developed, and Johan touched upon this as well, of looking at different components of just as well the full-length form of androgen receptor, including all the splice variants. So we look at isolating CTCs, fairly straightforward, not so much, but being able to further quantify those, CTC, by those CTCs and taking them into more next-generation sequencing platforms is what we're currently doing at Sinai in breast cancer, same things you can do within prostate cancer as well. Role of AR in prostate cancer, I won't go through uh, this in much detail. I think we've heard a lot about AR and its role, and I think the whole idea is that there are splice variants that were present. They've been identified since the early 2000s, and ARV7 is the most common one, but we're, I think it's very important to look at not just ARV7, but 5, 6, and 7 as a way to understand the entire composition of the AR pathway, including the full length. And that is evolving as you can see the challenges in understanding the ARV7 role. And there was a publication in JAMA Oncology of its role for resistance for enzalutamide and abiraterone, but there's further work that needs to be done with regards to this. And the exosome biology is using the same approach, so using the exosomes that Johan defined, identifying the ARV7, but then looking in that in a much more, uh, I think, informed way, so you can start looking at not just the presence of the ARV7, but its quantitative value, and I think that then helps us to further discriminate, because I think you need to have more information with respect to the overall processes that are involved. So in, in summary, in just, I know that was a lot of information about biomarker biology, but I think I covered the entire field. <laughs> so the, the key take-home messages, I think, are there's multiple prognostic and predictive tests that are available, and I think we need to understand their, the impact that they can have on clinical management. Liquid biopsies, to me, represent the next generation of our biomarker tools. Although the accuracy metrics appear compatible, so this is just a, a, a word to the wise, that not all assays are created equal. And you have to understand the clinical elements that went into derive the trials, that went into the assay accuracy itself is important. It's important to understand those clinical studies because they're critical in terms of the intended use population. So that's true of all biomarker studies. So just because they all have AUCs that are comparable, that doesn't mean they're the same. 
And I think what I hope I've convinced you in the precise methodology approach that tissue, tissue analytics and that in situ cellular component is a critical aspect of this. So any of the grind and find studies that I showed you will lose any of the features that are present within the tissue itself. And with that, I'll close. Thank you.